Welcome to the exam room live brought to you by the physicians committee. Hi, I am the weight loss champion and this is the healthiest half hour anywhere online today. Appreciate you joining us right here on Facebook and on YouTube. Going to do our best to both educate, inspire and enlighten you over the next 30 minutes. On tap today, really interesting discussion. Is the high fat standard American diet posing a threat to more than just our health? The new paper says yes, it is actually posing a threat to national security. We're going to discuss that with Dr. Jim Loomis. Dr. Loomis, really interesting topic. Really looking forward to diving into this one with you. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking and forward Dr. to it as well. And Dr. Loomis also going to be sticking around to answer your questions as we open up the doctor's mailbag. And we're also going to be joined for that by dietitian extraordinaire Lee Crosby. Lee, enter and say hi to the masses, if you will. Hello, all. So glad to be here. Happy Friday. Can't wait to jump into it. All right. And so go ahead and enter your questions right now in the chat box. All things diet, health, nutrition related are fair game. You can also tweet them to us using the hashtag exam room podcast. And I promise you, you will not find anyone more knowledgeable about health and diet and nutrition than those two right there. But before we get to anything else, let's get caught up on the latest happenings. Here are your health headlines for Friday, July 24th, 2020. The U.S. is now beyond 4 million coronavirus cases, the milestone serving as a reminder of how rapidly infections are spreading throughout much of the country, the rate essentially doubling over the last month. It was just 15 days ago that the 3 millionth case was recorded. Previously, it had taken 45 days to jump from 1 to 2 million cases, and then 27 days to climb to 3 million, according to records kept by the Washington Post. Thursday, also marking the third consecutive day with 1,000 or more coronavirus-related deaths, pushing the total number of fatalities to 144,000 with no signs of slowing down. The CDC is now forecasting as many as another 30,000 people will die over the next four weeks, with nine states expected to be hit the hardest, including Florida, Texas, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. In other news, new research is showing an alarming rise in cases of kidney disease among Mexican Americans. Researchers from Johns Hopkins say while races of the while rates of the disease have largely remained steady among other races, the rate among Mexican Americans has nearly doubled in recent years. Data from nearly 55,000 participants was used to arrive at the findings, which also show those who have low income and education levels have higher rates of kidney disease, regardless of race. Researchers are also calling for a renewed effort to mitigate the disparities. A Black-owned vegan eatery in California is readying for a Big expansion. Oakland Solely Vegan has become a smash hit among customers for its Louisiana-inspired cuisine, developing what has been described as a cult-like following. Now owner Tamara Dyson is set to open three new locations in the Golden State, including one across the water in San Francisco, another down I-5 in West Hollywood, and a second location in Oakland is also in the works. Dyson tells Veg News amid the pandemic, the new restaurants will focus on takeout and delivery. Meanwhile, while Forbes is estimating the plant-based industry as a whole will grow tenfold over the next five years. And finally, file this under Believe It or Not. 54-year-old plant-based pugilist Mike Tyson is returning to the ring this fall for an exhibition bout. Iron Mike first adopted a plant-based diet about a decade ago in an effort to turn his life around and then recommitted himself to it last year, telling GQ magazine that he does not eat anything with a mother or a father. In his career, Tyson amassed a record of 50 wins compared to just six losses. He last fought professionally in 2005. Moving on, we have known for generations that being overweight is a threat to our health, but could the standard American diet and the exploding rates of obesity also pose another type of threat, one that jeopardizes national security? A growing number of top military leaders say yes, and a new white paper published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition this week echoes those same concerns, citing the overwhelming number of adults under the age of 24 who cannot qualify for military service due to medical reasons, with obesity being chief among them. Here now with more is Dr. Jim Loomis. He is the medical director of the Barnard Medical Center. Dr. Loomis, appreciate you taking the time to join us this Friday. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. 
It, it is a pleasure. And this is a really interesting topic, certainly one that we have not yet discussed on the show. And let's just start right here, because when you think of national security, you think about hackers, you think about invasions, you think about those types of things, but you really don't think about your local drive through also posing a risk to national security. What's the connection here? Well, so as you said just a minute ago in the lead in, um, recent studies suggested that about 70 percent of males of um, um, of kind of recruitment age uh, for the for the armed services are ineligible because of uh, medical reasons, and the the primary driver is obesity. About thirty uh, percent can't meet the weight standards to join the military. And in fact, in, uh, two years ago in two thousand eighteen, the army for the first time in decades uh, failed to meet their recruiting uh, 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 quotas. Um, the and, and what's interesting is. You know, most people don't realize that the Department of Defense is the largest employer in the United States. Uh, if you look at active duty, civilian employees, et cetera. And the DOD is also has the largest single health care expenditure in, in the country. If you, if there, there's over nine million people eligible for, for health care um, um, under the DOD. And that includes both active duty civilians and then retirees. Um, health care costs have skyrocketed in the DOD. Um, now taking up over 10% of the budget, you know, 50, 60 billion dollars a year the DOD spends on healthcare. And as we already know, um, not only is 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 the inability to recruit individuals to join the, the military, um, when we're when the military is spending that much money on healthcare, um, much of which, by the way, is spent on preventable diseases, that takes away funding for military readiness. Um, very interesting. Um, a few years ago, um, um, I was contacted by a now colonel in the Special Ops Command at Fort Bragg, who had actually written a, a, a thesis paper, a master's thesis, on this very issue: uh, uh, standard American diet is a threat to national security. And not only is it a, a threat to national security because of the reasons we just talked about, that you know we can't recruit people into the military. But also, once people join the military, men and women join the military, oftentimes their health deteriorates. They gain weight. They become less healthy because of the food they're fed on base and, and when they're deployed. Um, furthermore, even the, the warfighters who are, who are ready, who, who, who have, um, um, are mission ready, um, they maintain adequate diet. They may, they're physically active. Oftentimes, they can't be mission focused because they're worried about their loved ones, friends and family back home who have the same kind of chronic degenerative diseases like heart disease and diabetes and cancer, all of which are driven by um, the standard American diet. So uh, it sounds like the problem then is, is multifaceted from obviously the health perspective, but then you're saying, well, if the friends, family, loved ones back home are also uh, facing health challenges, the mind just isn't where it needs to be in terms of being ready for action. Uh, so this is this is a real big kind of a problem. And I know the paper that you shared with me, the one that you're talking about, also looks specifically at the effect that a plant-based diet, wide adoption of plant-based diets could have in rectifying these issues. What was the conclusion there? So, um, you know, according to the calculations by the officer who wrote the paper, um, he feels like that, that the military could save between 10 and $20 billion a year in cost savings just by moving toward a plant-based diet. Um, what, what's interesting is, so I, I'm actually on the faculty at the Uniform uh, uh, Services University for Health Sciences here in Bethesda, which is the military medical school. And um, I lecture there to both students and, and medical residents. These are military doctors who are going out to take care uh, of, of uh, the war fighters uh, deployed around the world. And um, it's interesting that when we have tried to have discussions around healthcare cost savings with, uh, uh, with members of the faculty at USIS and, and higher ups in the DOD, uh, it really hasn't gotten a lot of traction. What's very interesting though is, is since Game Changers has come out and, and we've kind of refocused the lens uh, from healthcare costs to performance uh, and, and readiness, um, there's a much bigger audience. People are really starting to listen. And we've actually done um, a Game Changers screening at USIS, at the, med at the medical school, at the Defense Health Agency, out, which is here in, locally in Virginia, which is, is the 
centralized command for all things health within the DOD. Um, and also many um, uh, military bases, the Air Force Academy, um, um, the Air Force Base in, um, in, in Missouri, Whitman, uh, Whiteman Air Force Base. So there's been a very interesting um, um, resurgence in interest, but it's not around healthcare costs, it's around performance. The beautiful thing about a plant-based diet though is, is that it doesn't matter if you're coming at it from a cost saving standpoint or a readiness performance standpoint, the outcomes are still positive either way, any way you look at it. How feasible is it to think that you could have this wide adoption of it in the military? I'm not saying that it's going to happen, but is it, you know, we hear a lot about those of us who aren't in the military, things like MREs, you know, meals ready to eat for, for our soldiers who are overseas. Is it feasible to think that there could be plant-based options for those? Oh, sure. Of course there is. And, and uh, you know, I, I think that just like when you look at U.S. Dairy, dietary guidelines, which help drive some of the, mil in fact, U.S. dietary guidelines help drive some of the um, thinking around, around nutrition in the military. Um, there's a lot of economic inertia to overcome. I'll just put it that way. Um, the contracts with these big food purveyors like, like you know, Cisco or whatever that they provide or Aramac, who, Aramac who provides uh, the food on base and, and you know, out when, when uh, uh, soldiers are deployed. Um, that's a multi-billion dollar business. And um, I, I, there's a lot of kind of economic inertia that needs to be overcome um, to really and truly implement this on a, on a wide scale. And you said that a lot of the decisions for military nutrition are driven by the dietary guidelines, which right now are under review. From what we've seen, uh, the recommendation appears to be pointing away from red meat, away from processed meat, and certainly more toward a plant-based diet. Do you think that just because if things go as expected, that the dietary guidelines that will be released in early January, we can see some steps in this direction for the military over the next five, 10 years. I, I hope so. And, and I, the other reason I'm hopeful is, is uh, through my work at USIS, um, there's an increasing interest at, at the command level on, uh, and, and, and teaching, you know, just, you know, another part of the problem is, it's just like I didn't learn anything about nutrition when I went to medical school, neither are these military doctors. Um, you know, there is a small component of, of nutrition education in the, in the med school curriculum, but it's not enough. And it's, it's really not about food. It's really glorified biochemistry. You know, this is a protein, this is a vitamin, this is what happens, you don't get enough. It's really, it's really focused on the disease states that occur from deficiencies in these very, in the various components of mac micronutrients and macronutrients uh, that our food's made out of. Um, but, but there's a growing interest in not only um, the um, plant-based diet and nutrition in general, but things like culinary medicine, on and on. So I'm very hopeful that 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 you know change change driven from the bottom by the doctors who are being trained by the military medical school and coming into the military to take care of people, and from command down. That hope I'm hopeful that that we'll start to see changes uh, soon. And if those changes are implemented among active military members over time, then I would expect that the uh, positive effect would then translate to veterans. We've heard stories uh, from the VA of just enormously long lines for people to get their insulin, metformin, right. diabetes related medications. I've spoken with you know people who have waited in all those lines, people right. like uh, Bob Blackburn, who was featured in one of Dr. Neil Barnard's books. I expect then that there would be an enormous savings from the VA standpoint over time as well. Yeah, what's interesting is, um, you know, many members of the military are quite physically active. And so they kind of, they can kind of outrun, if you will, their, their poor dietary habits. But the problem is when they separate, when they retire from the military and go back into civilian life and their physical activity goes down, well, guess what? then all of these chronic diseases all of a sudden blossom, the diabetes and such as that. So, so um, you know, really at the core is the nutrition. And, and um, um, I, I would agree that, in fact, uh, the, the healthcare cost savings uh, would not only with active duty military personnel, but also, and probably more importantly, in, in retirees, when we look at healthcare costs and, uh, and, and the drain it on our society about getting adequate care for our veterans. 
Very interesting. Very, very interesting stuff. We have to leave it there and move on and open up the doctor's mailbag. But uh, Dr. Loomis, what a heck of a topic. I feel like there's so much more that we could get to on this. Yeah, thank you. All right. Let's open up that doctor's mailbag right now. Dr. Loomis is going to be sticking around, but let's bring in a dietitian extraordinaire, Lee Crosby, to field the first question. Uh, Lee, thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Sure. I'm liking this new extraordinaire label. I don't know how I got it, but I'll take it. <laughs> We're just mixing it up a little bit because it's Friday. Uh, so here's the deal. If you have a diet or health or nutrition related question, go ahead and post that in the comment section. Right now, we're going to do our best between Lee and Dr. Loomis to answer as many as we can with the time that we have remaining. Lee, first question comes to you. This one comes to us from Lance. He wants to know, I've heard that you shouldn't eat kale and spinach together because one blocks absorption of nutrients with another. Are you familiar at all with that? So I think he's talking about, well, first I'm all about people eating greens anyway, whenever they want. So if you want to eat your kale and spinach together, you just go for it. So what I think he's referring to is that some of the leafy greens, specifically spinach and Swiss chard are quite high in something called oxalates. And what those can do is those, those same leafy greens are also high in calcium but because they're high in oxalates at the same time, oxalate binds the calcium and keeps you from absorbing it very well. If you are eating kale or mustard greens or collard greens or any of those sort of cabbage family greens, they don't have a very high oxalate level. So you can absorb a bunch of calcium from them. So I think the sort of transitive property of oxalate and greens, he's saying that, well, if you mix the two, you might not be able to absorb the calcium from the kale as well, because you're getting oxalates from the spinach. I think that's where he's going. And the answer is, I don't know a study on that, but it seems plausible to me. So if you're really looking to max out your calcium intake, sure, go ahead, have your kale or your collard greens separate from your spinach. But if you're just looking for good health, go, go ahead and mix it up, live it up. All right, Fiber Queen, coming back to you for the second question. This one comes to us from Kathy Hines at 1216 from YouTube. She wants to know, what are the negative effects of cooking with kosher salt? Well, salt in general, not helpful. And for a number of things, blood pressure obviously is the first one that comes to mind. But if you're trying to eat an anti-inflammatory diet, also you're going to want to minimize the added salt. Um, so most salts are fairly similar. People are really excited about pink Himalayan salt right now. But that's really, it looks cooler, but it's not got any particular health benefits. Um, the only thing I actually really like people, if, they're go if you're going to include added salt, is make sure you actually buy the old-fashioned iodized kind because... That can be a nutrient that can be a little harder to come by on a plant-based diet unless you're eating lots of these sea vegetables, in which case you're covered. Um, but again, if you're trying to keep your blood pressure under control, if you're just trying to eat an anti-inflammatory diet in general, you're going to want to minimize added salt. So whether it's kosher or pink Himalayan or some other fancy whatever, and even iodized, you're going to want to keep that intake relatively low. And when you do add salt, again, my advice is to add the iodized kind. It, it's also cheaper for what it's worth although not as pretty. I agree. <laughs> All right, Dr. Loomis coming to you for this one. This is right in your wheelhouse coming from Renee Davis Carter at 1217. Renee wants to know, do professional football players learn about nutrition? Well, that's an interesting question. And I, I think, it, you know, I, you know, any professional athlete at that, at that high level and, and even high performing, you know, high school, college athletes, certainly, uh, profess to know about nutrition. Um, but a lot of their nutrition education is in the form of what I call bro science, right? It's, uh, you know, some other player friend in the locker room teammate who's big and strong and you want to be like them. So, so you ask them what they eat and they tell you about all the boneless, skinless chicken breasts and protein shakes. And so that's what you do. Um, they're, they're, um, you know, when I was with the Rams, uh, we did have, uh, nutritionists um, on staff. This was back before I was enlightened about a plant-based diet, and, and before a lot of the research was done, frankly. But 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 honestly, um, the, the players did not turn to the dietitians for their nutrition advice because oftentimes it was counter to what they thought they were was the right thing to do. So, and, and I think that's true across all professional sports. So I think that's starting to change. And I, again, I, you know, I think Game Changers has really opened a lot of professional athletes' eyes to, to see that, you know, you don't have to eat meat to perform at a high level. And if you don't eat meat, you're going to be healthier and the planet will be healthier, which was really the message of Game Changers to start with. So, so I, I, think, I think the, the views toward nutrition are starting to change. I have changed 
uh, especially even in professional sports, um, partly driven by game changers, which I was proud to be part of. Yeah, and uh, I, you're spot on. Uh, in the years that I spent covering the team here in Washington, I know of a number of players who had outside uh, dietitians uh, that they were working with, dietitians and nutritionists uh, who helped get them clean up completely unaffiliated with the team. And the way it works is one guy would start working with uh, this person and they would have good results and then other players would take notice and they would start asking. And before you know it, this person had a huge roster of clients right in the locker room. Um, sticking with uh, you here, uh, Dr. Loomis, question from Sheila at 1219. She says, hello from the Philippines. Hi, thanks for joining us. I'd like to ask for a type two diabetic who is elderly, how much is too much when it comes to carbohydrate intake? Talking about carbs from rice, corn, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. Um, well, the answer is there is no such thing as too much carbohydrates from rice, corn, potatoes, and sweet potatoes. And I, I think you know, if you look at the macronutrient ratios of a whole food plant-based diet, which has been shown, in fact, to help prevent, treat, and even reverse type 2 diabetes, it's about 75% carbs. But but I think, the again, this really reflects, and I've alluded to this on the show in the past, this really reflects how deeply embedded nutritional reductionism is in, in the way we think about food. And, or we, you know, the fact we don't even think about food, we think about what food's made out of, because it's not the carbohydrates that are the problem. It's the package the carbohydrates come in. And, and I think I've used this example in the past, but you think about an apple, right? Small apple, 100 calories, 25 grams of carbs. Where are the apple? Where are the, where's that sugar at? Well, it's in the apple. Our bodies have to do physical work. We actually burn calories to, to liberate those carbs. Uh, soluble fiber absorbs water, slows the progression to the digestive tract. Those carbs, are that sugars are very slowly in the digestive tract. Our insulin levels rise very slowly. All is good. So it has a low glycemic load, okay? Uh, glycemic load is the propensity of a given food to, to, to trigger insulin release. You take that same apple, squeeze out the same 100, uh, 100 calories, 25 grams of fat, you run it over, it, put it in a glass, you run it over to the, to, the, to the chemistry lab, and it's the same calories, same calories, same sugar, but now it's in the glass, we drink it. In no way, shape, or form are those calories and those carbs handled the same physiologically because it's absorbed right out of the upper part of our intestine. Our sugar levels shoot right through the roof, not good for a type 2 diabetic. So it's not the carbs that are the problem. It is the package, the carbs come in, very, very important. And if you're going to limit anything in a type 2, di in type two diabetes, what you really need to focus on is not the carbs, it's the fat, because it's fat in the muscle and liver cells, which creates the insulin resistance, which, which, which overworks our pancreas, because now we have to make more insulin every time we eat, uh, which ultimately leads to type 2 diabetes. So, so fats are much more of a concern than, than unprocessed carbs. And you, and frankly, you can eat as many unprocessed carbs as you want, um, 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 because it's not the carbs; it's the package. The carbs come in. Very, very important point. Lee Crosby coming to you. It's a sodium follow-up. This one from Susan at twelve twenty-three. She wants to know: Are the salt replacements made of seaweed and kelp still too much sodium, or is there a difference? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I haven't seen that many. They're going to have a salty flavor, so that would help some. It depends on if they're, sometimes you'll see the ones that are a mix of like a, of a seaweed granule and salt. In that case, you're just going to want to check the label for sodium. And that's the nice thing for all of these. They are required on the label to have the amount of sodium. And general sort of guideline is less than 2,300 milligrams a day. If someone has high blood pressure, we're talking more less than 1,500 milligrams a day. So my answer would be to just check, check the label and see where that falls. Um, the other nice thing I like about the seaweed sprinkles is that, again, you're getting iodine where you don't really need to add salt if you're getting one that's no salt added. Just do be careful because some of them, like kelp, can be very high in iodine, like actually a little too high. So, again, check the label in terms of sodium because it's hard to know. There are so many different brands out there if there's added salt or not. Remember, you're shooting for, eh, we'll just say around 2,000 milligrams or less per day, a little less than that if you have high blood pressure as an issue. But um, other than that, yeah, I do like the trace minerals that are in seaweeds. Just watch out for the ones that are super high in iodine, like kelp. You, yeah, want, a you, said, you want a bliss point on iodine. When you said seaweed sprinkles, all I could think of was like sprinkling that on top of nice cream. And I'm just like, that is... No, that's just not happening right mm, now. I was thinking that's more like happening. a 2 no salad ice cream. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, right. ready for lunch. <laughs> All right, uh, here we go. We're in the, the home stretch here. Another question from Byron at 1221. We know that uh, sodium has been linked to hypertension, but Byron wants to know, what do you recommend to address hypertension? I avoid salt, but I need some whole food plant-based ways to stabilize my blood pressure. Okay. Blood pressure, a couple of things I really like. I know we've talked about dark leafy greens, but I really love dark leafy greens. They're rich in potassium, which is excellent when you're trying to lower your blood pressure. Assuming you don't have advanced chronic kidney disease, there's always something, isn't there? Um, they're also rich in magnesium. All of these can have effects in terms of helping your blood vessels, the, the lining, the endothelial lining of your blood vessels to actually heal. And in that sense, but in a short and in a shorter term kind of perspective, again, the, the potassium and the magnesium can actually help lower your blood sugar without having to go through and actually heal up the insides of your blood vessels. So, and lowering sodium intake, as you already know. So where are you gonna find those besides leafy greens? Um, things like mango, potatoes we we're talking about. Again, not deep fried potatoes, just the baked kind um, or steamed or anything like that or roast them with some seasonings without oil. Um, those are actually a great source of potassium as well. So yeah, they're actually, and bananas are good, but they're really not, as good as everyone makes them out to be for potassium. They're fine, go ahead, eat your banana, but it's, you know, there are other things. And you can Google, if you wanna just Google a list, particularly if you find one that's like from a .gov or .edu, to look at the foods that are highest in potassium, um, that's a good place to start if you're wanting to sort of go next level on that and greens. But again, did I mention leafy greens? <laughs> You, yeah, I, I, I believe you did. You, I think you said that you may like them. You're still on the fence. Yeah, I don't know. I feel, no, yeah, again, you can't, you really can't go wrong. Greens are going to be, in terms of blood pressure, I've seen really good results in the clinic with people who, when they started, and I don't mean like I'm having a side salad. I mean like half a cup or a cup of like steamed leafy greens per day, like, like a medication. You take it, you know, every day you're eating that somewhere or a giant salad. And again, not out of a cute little bowl, but like out of a mixing bowl kind of salad. That's the kind of thing we're talking about in terms of helping lower blood pressure. All right. Let's close up the doctor's mailbag for today. But if we didn't get to your question, have no fear. We save each and every one that comes in and we will try to get you an answer on an upcoming episode. So keep on sending them in the comment section or you can tweet them to us at PCRM or at Chuck Carroll WLC using the hashtag exam room podcast. You can also find us on Twitter or I just said Twitter, uh, Instagram and Facebook as well. Man, I got a case of the Fridays, right? Uh, anyway, you may be wondering right now, you've just been hit with all of this nutrition knowledge and you may be thinking, man, I wish I had a doctor I could talk to that knows all about this. And the good news is you do. At the Barnard Medical Center, you can, via the wonders of telemedicine, meet with all of our doctors and dietitians who can really help take your health to the next level as they address the root cause of the problem and not just treating the symptoms. And some big news, we know that Florida has just been added to the roster of states where telemedicine is available. Well, now we can say that Georgia is one of the states that also can uh, see patients for the Barnard Medical Center. So if you would like to make that appointment, go ahead and pick up the phone. You see that number on your screen, 202-527-7500 or visit barnardmedical.org, barnardmedical.org to schedule that appointment. The other states, we said Georgia and Florida, you can also uh, make an appointment if you live in California, New York, right here in Washington, DC, Maryland, Virginia, Missouri, Arizona, Colorado, Massachusetts, or Kentucky all of those states. You can absolutely make an appointment today. And hopefully, just like Georgia and Florida, we will be adding more in the very near future. Now on the show today, we talked about the toll that a poor diet can take on your health and on national security. But what about the toll it can have on the climate? and climate change. That is the focus of the latest episode of the Exam Room podcast, which we are calling How Your Dinner Affects the Environment. In it, I get an opportunity to speak with Dr. Martin Heller. And what he does is he examines how the foods that are being produced, how some of them create more greenhouse gases versus some which create less. So what are the more environmentally friendly foods there? And once we've discovered that, he also shows a link to how the diets that are high in greenhouse gas emissions can also increase your risk of dying from some of the leading causes of death out there today. It is a 
fascinating conversation that I really hope that you get an opportunity to explore. So head on over to Apple Podcast or Spotify or Stitcher and look for the Exam Room Podcast by the Physicians Committee. Hit that subscribe button and leave a five-star rating if you would be so kind. Dr. Heller, by the way, is also going to be speaking at length about your diet and the environment at the upcoming International Conference on Nutrition and Medicine. And special for Exam Room viewers, we are offering 20% off the cost of registration. When you sign up, just use the promo code EXAM20. EXAM20 as the promo code for 20% off. Head over to pcrm.org slash ICNM to register today. That event coming up quickly, August 6th through 8th. And coming up Monday, right back here on the Exam Room Live, a huge show. We will be joined by Dr. Neil Barnard and also the one, the only, the incomparable Dr. Kim Williams will also be right here on the exam room live. So set your set your calendars, mark it down, noon Eastern, Monday, right back here on Facebook and on YouTube for the exam room live, a huge show. But for today, we are fresh out of time. My thanks to the crew behind the scenes that makes the magic happen. Our director is Donna Steele and our producer is Laura Anderson. On behalf of Dr. Jim Loomis and Lee Crosby and everyone here at the Physicians Committee, I am the weight loss champion, Chuck Carroll. Thank you so very much for joining us. And until Monday, please remember, take a stand, stay safe, and keep it plant-based. <laughs>